Hello and welcome to the South Central Texas Winter 2020-2021 Seasonal Outlook. My name is Keith White and I'm Meteorologist and Climate Services Focal Point here at the National Weather Service office covering San Antonio and Austin. And uh, I'm re-recording this on the morning of Tuesday, December 15th. There were some sound issues on yesterday's live recording. Thank you to everybody who joined us live and I will get started with this version. So first we'll take a quick look at, uh, at fall 2020 starting September 1st through November 30th. And um, the map shows percent of normal precipitation across our area. And you can see that in general, uh, below to well below normal precipitation uh, across the majority of our region, um, a large portion of the rain that fell over the course of fall came during the first three or so weeks of September. And um, a big portion of that over areas south and southeast of San Antonio centered there on Wilson and Carnes counties. And, uh, you know, a couple other smaller areas uh, where we're seeing rainfall surpluses over fall 2020 uh, here in, in Kinney and Edwards County and then some smaller areas across the hill country in Austin Metro. Um, overall, it was warm as well, uh, tied for the third warmest fall uh, on record at Del Rio, not quite as uh, warm for our I-35 areas. Um, and in general, anywhere between about 50 and 80% of normal fall rainfall uh, at most of our climate sites. Um, also, this map shows the temperature anomaly and you can see that uh, it was much warmer than normal over the Winter Garden region, uh, Eagle Pass, Dimmit County, etc., and warmer than normal across the vast majority of our area with the exception of uh, Real County and surrounding areas and then a small pocket over Llano County as well where it was just slightly cooler than average if you take the whole fall uh, and, and average it out. Um, Austin and Del Rio actually set new records for number of days reaching 80 plus degrees Fahrenheit in November. Uh, more than half the month at really all four of our climate sites saw days reaching 80 or above in the month of November. And that was after a cooler than normal September. So quite the regime change uh, from the late summer months uh, into the early fall. Taking a look at percent of normal rainfall as of uh, yesterday, uh, I didn't change the uh, the top bar here, my apologies, but this is as of December 14th. And you can see over the last 30 days, that one rainfall event that we had on November 27th and 28th uh, did bring some really beneficial rainfall to uh, portions of Maverick County up through Uvalde County, and then again over into Wilson County. Um, but uh, looking over longer time periods, you can see that those rainfall surpluses kind of disappear. We did have dry weather in the late summer prior to our wet September. Uh, and unfortunately, all that rain in September wasn't enough to make up for uh, how dry it's been since, in addition to how dry it was before that. So out over 180 days, you can see uh, a vast swath of our western portions of our area at uh, 50 to 25 percent of normal rainfall over the last half a year. And so those, uh, those rainfall deficits um, have led to an expansion of drought once again. Uh, the map here on the bottom uh, shows the latest drought monitor and uh, this map shows the one um, right around the time of my last Outlook webinar. Uh, after all that rain in September, we did see some improvements um, still holding on to long-term drought over uh, western, southwestern portions of the area. But of course, after a dry October, a dry November, uh, and October is usually a wet month for most of South Central Texas, that did allow drought to expand quite a bit. Um, to changing gears a little bit here, let's talk about what a, a normal winter looks like across our area. So this is a, a climatology. We'll start with the rainfall here on the right. And you can see that um, for most of our locations, the winter months are dry. Uh, at Del Rio, they're the driest month, three months of the year. And uh, uh, same goes for San Antonio. At Austin, um, July is technically drier, but on the whole, uh, if you look at whole seasons, uh, winter is typically the driest season for, for Austin as well. Um, Severe weather, relatively uncommon. We average about 12 severe thunderstorm warnings and two tornado warnings each winter, uh, and about seven flash flood warnings. So uh, you can clearly see in terms of reports, it's our quietest season. Once we get towards the end of February, we do see a little bit of an uptick in severe weather, especially in hail reports. Uh, but then that continues, of course, into our primary severe weather season in the spring. 
looking at snowfall, uh, we, we define measurable snowfall as anything uh, over a tenth of an inch. And that occurs in our area uh, anywhere from about every three to six years. And the last occurrence of measurable snow, of course, uh, we just celebrated the three year anniversary of that last week. Um, and uh, many of you may remember in the Austin area and points north, we had a nice little snowfall uh, in last February, I believe it was the 5th. Um, that did not produce measurable snowfall in the city of Austin, however. Uh, any snowfall over an inch looks to occur about every 10 to maybe 13 years. Uh, and again, the last occurrence of that uh, for some locations was that 12-7-2017 event. Uh, but at Camp Mabry, you'd have to go all the way back to 2004 for the last inch of snow at that location. And of course at Del Rio, uh, even further, 1993 was the last time Del Rio saw more than an inch of snow. Uh, so now taking a look at our outlook, as many of you know, our uh, fall and winter climate here is driven largely by the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And of course, uh, we're well into a La Nina winter at this point, 100% uh, chance of that continuing through the winter. And then uh, you can see um, as we head through the spring uh, and into the summer, it looks pretty likely that we'll be returning to Enso neutral, meaning this will likely be a one-year uh, La Nina event. Um, this map on the right was produced almost a month ago. The new one should be out here in a few days, uh, but the latest data actually show a slight weakening in uh, the sea surface temperature anomaly in the equatorial eastern Pacific. So at this point, we look pretty locked into a moderate intensity event. Uh, you like to see a few months um, of sea surface temperature anomalies in that minus 1 to minus 1.5 degree range to be confident in a moderate strength event. Um, and what that means here in South Central Texas is typically warmer conditions uh, than the climatological normals. So this map uh, basically takes a composite of all the La Nina years going back to the 1950s and then compares it to the long-term average of all years. And you can see here, of course, these areas cover larger zones than uh, what we cover here at our office. But it's pretty clear that a, a warm anomaly is, is present in this data. And so we can say with pretty high confidence that most La Nina winters are warmer than normal. There are a few years in there um, in that uh, data record with near to maybe even slightly below normal temperatures. But uh, most of the time, we can say with high confidence it's going to be warm. The signal a little bit weaker for precipitation. So uh, still looks you know drier than normal in the composite. But, uh, you know, there's maybe a few more years that were wetter than normal. Um, and we'll, we'll say what that means for our forecast here in a few minutes. Uh, in terms of snowfall, this is broken out just by number of occurrences uh, over El Nino and uh, other years. And there's not a strong signal in snowfall occurrence for El Nino. Maybe at San Antonio you can say, you know, more occurrences of snow in El Nino years. Um, but there's not a, not a strong signal for La Nina. Uh, that said, despite the fact that we expect warmer and drier than normal conditions, that doesn't mean we're completely out uh, you know, in the clear. Uh, some of our more impactful winter weather events in South Central Texas have come during La Nina winters. Of course, that event uh, three years ago was during a weak to moderate La Nina event. And the San Antonio snow of record over a foot in January of 1985, that was also in a weak to moderate La Nina winter. Um, and then, of course, uh, on the same weekend as that 2017 event, back in 2005, there was uh, an ice storm in northern portions of the I-35 corridor, again, in a weak La Nina year. So uh, you can never let your guard down on winter weather impacts. Um, looking at severe weather, um, there's a pretty strong signal that El Nino winters are above average in terms of severe reports. Uh, La Nina, not so much. So we can say with pretty decent confidence that, um, you know, not expecting a lot in the way of severe impacts through the winter. There, there aren't usually many in a climatological, you know, on average winter. And uh, if most of those are taken up in El Nino, we can, we can likely assume um, severe events aren't uh, very likely. Again, you can't completely rule one out. Uh, so we'll switch gears here and uh, look at some model data. This is a long-term model called the Climate Forecast System. And uh, what you're looking at here is a skill-masked 
uh, temperature anomaly forecast for December through February. And so all of these areas in the gray are blacked out because that's where the model doesn't necessarily have high confidence in the data. But here in South Central Texas, it does. It looks like it'll be warmer than normal, potentially one to two degrees Celsius warmer than normal on average. Uh, it's worth noting that um, using um, observational data going back into November, these were actually showing higher anomalies in the two to three degree range and have since backed off just a little bit. And that may be in response to some, uh, you know, slight warming in equatorial uh, Pacific sea surface temperature over the past couple of weeks. In terms of precipitation, maybe a little bit of a weaker signal. Still looks to be uh, drier than normal on average through the, the winter. Uh, same thing as temperature where the observations added in over the early part of December have given us maybe slightly higher confidence in near normal precipitation for northern portions of our area. Uh, we'll see how this plays out and we'll also look at the human-made forecast uh, that takes into account a number of other models here in just a moment. So uh, we'll start with the CPC Climate Prediction Center forecasts over the short term. And those of you who have been watching our forecast know that over the next week, rain chances uh, aren't fantastic, but Friday night into Saturday could see some decent showers uh, in some areas, not necessarily adding up to a whole lot. Uh, but once we get into later December, uh, warmer and drier than normal uh, looks likely, especially from the 19th to the 23rd. Um, and then on the 21st through the 27th, uh, you know, towards Christmas and after, uh, maybe looking at um, equal chances for above and below normal temperatures, uh, still looking like a 33 to 40% chance of drier than normal conditions sticking with us until December 27th. Um, then over the week three and four outlook, a, a weak signal but broad over most of, of the United States stretching across the entire uh, central plains and up into the northeast at a 50 to 55 percent chance for above normal temperatures over the December 26th to January 8th period. And then uh, 60 percent or better for drier than normal conditions over that period as well. And of course, uh, many of you have already seen this, but the winter outlook uh, for December through the end of February that was made uh, on November 19th shows um, a very solid signal for above normal temperatures across our region through the period uh, in the 50 to 60 percent chance of below normal precipitation uh, as well. What does that mean for our drought? Well, this was produced on November 19th, so since then we've actually been able to remove some of the drought here over some of our coastal plains counties. However, over the course of winter, we can expect um, drought to continue. Um, given that winter is already our driest month, uh, any degradation or expansion would be slower than what we saw in October and November. But um, still, the general idea is that it, it, we're likely to see drought persist and, and slowly expand through the winter with the forecast of below normal precipitation. And that will mean a lot for, for our fire weather. So taking a quick look first at the keech Byram Drought Index, which is a measurement of moisture deficiency, you can see the values remain rather high over western portions of our area. You can also see the impacts of that late November rainfall, especially here in Wilson County, where KBDI values are much, much lower. Um, but uh, clearly quite dry across a good portion of our region. Not quite as bad as they've had it in the Trans-Pecos, Big Bend region, and then up into the southwestern Panhandle. Um, but you know, well, not what we want to see after what would normally be a wet season in the fall. So um, switching gears a little bit and looking at energy release components, uh, generally running above normal near our values at this time last year. Uh, not quite at record values at any location. Uh, these areas actually are broken up quite differently than ours. So you can see here in central Texas that uh, 2020 values have been falling over the last week and are now below normal. That's largely due to rainfall and cooler weather up in uh, the Waco and Temple areas that are included in this zone that also stretches all the way down to uh, Kamal and Lavaca counties. Uh, but in, in general, across much of our area, you know, uh, above normal, uh, energy release components at this time. Um, and I haven't shown it here, but the National Interagency Fire Center outlook shows above normal significant wildland fire potential, um, especially over our northern zones for December and then across our entire area once we get into 2021. 
Uh, grasses are now considered freeze cured. Winter is upon us, so cold fronts will bring us gusty winds and lower humidity and will continue to pose a uh, threat for en enhancing fire potential, just as we saw um, just the other day here on Sunday. Um, and I, I've borrowed this graph here from the Texas A&M Forest Service Winter uh, Spring Outlook. And it just shows over the last 15 years um, the contrast between La Nina fire seasons and non-La Nina fire seasons. That is a fire season in, in the spring, which peaks typically late February through about April, um, that comes after a La Nina winter. Clearly, um, most of our uh, fire weather impacts, in, and this is Texas-wide, by the way, uh, do occur during La Nina winters. So we can expect with re relatively high certainty um, an active fire weather season, especially once we get out of the winter and into the spring months next year. So just to summarize what I've stated here today, um, the dry antecedent conditions and an expectation of drier than normal conditions continuing through the winter lead us to believe that there's a pretty low threat of heavy rain, flash flooding, or riverine flooding. However, you know, all it takes is one really impactful heavy rainfall event to cause problems. So as always, uh, we're, we're diligently paying attention to the forecast. Uh, in terms of fire weather, that'll probably be our biggest impact, above normal impacts through the winter, and then especially as we get into late winter and spring. Uh, severe weather, near to below normal impacts are expected. Of course, you can't rule out a stray event occurring sometime through the winter months, but uh, you know, waiting for spring for uh, more chances at severe weather. And winter weather, near normal impacts are expected. Again, some of our more impactful events have occurred during La Nina winters, so uh, we can never let our guard down. Always want to ensure that we're paying close attention to the forecast. So if anybody has any questions about this presentation, of course, you can reach me directly at my email, keith.white at noaa.gov, or you can reach our office 24-7 at the numbers shown. Thank you so much for joining me today.